welcome everyone to our last lecture for Introduction to Oceanography, Geology 1530. I hope you're all doing well. I hope you're having a good week and that you're holding up as this semester rolls to its conclusion and that you're feeling confident about succeeding uh, next week during finals. All right. Um, before we get started, I want to remind you of what's coming up. All right, we have our final next week and I will send details about that. But our last class after this lecture, this is our, our second to last class, our last class is a review session. We will have an online e meeting about it. All right, so that will take place in real time. So you won't be able to ask questions in that forum unless you actually come to it and attend it. And I do expect everyone to attend that. And I will be awarding points for asking questions. All right, so everyone should come to that with a few questions. I'll send you an email about that, all right? Another thing I'd like to remind you of is if you have questions beyond that, come on to office hours or send me an email or gosh, it, gosh, it would be a great time to set up a study group with some of your colleagues, right? All of those things would be wonderful. So if you have questions, those are some of the options you have for getting them answered. Let's start today's lecture talking about the effects of climate change on the oceans. Last week's lecture focused on climate change in general. So we talked about what is climate change. We discussed the difference between climate and weather, the idea that weather uh, takes place over a shorter period of time, like it's raining today and it's sunny tomorrow and maybe in a month or so it's going to snow, right? Climate on the other hand is more of an average. So things like um, most of the time, areas that are closer to the equator are warmer than areas that are further from the equator, things like that. We know that climate changes on this planet. We know it changes all the time. We've seen evidence of that. We've had eras that were quite warm. We've had eras that were quite cold. For example, the ice ages, we talked about those. We have eras that are wet. We have eras that are dry. So it is normal for climate to be changing on Earth. We also know that human culture evolved during a particularly pleasant era in our climate history on Earth. And I like to think of this as the Goldilocks time, when it wasn't too hot and it wasn't too cold and there was a, enough rainfall, but not too much rainfall to sustain agriculture. Now humans have been around before that era, but for us to truly thrive, for our population to expand, for our culture to evolve and things like agriculture um, to evolve or things like um, education to evolve, using technology, those really, those evolved during this pleasant era. So we've been pretty lucky um, because we had this, we've had this pleasant era. We also know that we're undergoing a time of accelerated climate change and accelerated temperature change. Right now, the temperature on Earth is increasing rapidly, and we saw examples of this from around the world um, for from the past year, from last month, in fact. Uh, we saw the headlines about last month being very, very hot compared to other Septembers. And we've seen that this has happened over the course of the past 100 years or so, where we've seen a lot of temperature change. This accelerated climate change. We also talked about the fact that despite what you might see on social media or from people online, um, we know that the main driver of climate change is increased carbon dioxide from human activities. And you might see arguments that, oh, this is due to a volcano erupting or because of changing sun activities. But those are factors that we know are not the main factors of accelerated climate change. They may contribute to some climate change, to some small portion of it, but we know that the main driver is human activities, us burning fossil fuels, and that can be things like producing electricity with coal or natural gas, driving cars, heating our homes with oil, shipping things across oceans in big, big boats. These are the sorts of things that drive increased carbon dioxide and then in turn drive accelerated climate change. We also saw that the effects of climate change are broad and devastating. Now this is a lot to think about 
especially as you, most of you are starting your lives as young people. You're thinking about what kind of life you want to have. And I have to say, it's a real bummer to be born during this particular time when climate change really is going to be affecting our society, our health, um, agriculture, all sorts of things. So I know it's a lot to think about, but it is something that we all need to be thinking about. So if at any point you want to chat a little bit about how climate change is going to affect you, I would be happy to, to lend you an ear because I understand it's kind of a heavy topic. That being said, let's talk about the effects of climate change on the oceans. These are the six topics we're going to be talking about today. The idea that the oceans are warming in general. This can affect sea life. We also believe that um, ocean circulation is going to be changed because of climate change. We know that ice cover at the poles is decreasing. We know that something called acidification is occurring due to climate change. And we also know that sea level is rising. So these are our six big topics. There are other ones, but these are the six we're going to talk about in this lecture. The first thing we're going to talk about is the fact that the oceans are warming, and we have good evidence of that. Let me remind you that you can use this QR code to um, find the website where all of these um, figures are. So each one of our figures has a QR code with it. So if you want to get to the main source for that, you can go ahead and just scan that QR code and get to it. So let's take a look at this graph. First of all, let's look at the axes. We have on the Y axis, ocean heat content, and the, the unit here is joules. We haven't talked about joules, I don't think, in this course. But joule, a joule is a measurement of the amount of energy in, in something, all right? So we have down here, low energy in the oceans, and we have up here, high energy in the oceans. And you can see that that energy is represented as heat, all right, heat content. Let's look at our y-axis here. This is time. So we're looking at how energy in the oceans has changed from 1955 until 2020. This dotted line here is the average ocean heat content from 1971 to 2000. And then we have all of these, all of these data here. And each one of these colored lines represents data from a different organization. One of them is NOAA, which is the United States National Oceanographic and Atmospheric Administration. And these are from different um, governments from around the world. This one, for example, is from Australia. They all show the same general trend, though, where early in the time period in 1955, we had less energy than average. And then as we go through time, we have more and more energy in the oceans. Right? And you can see that somewhere around, I don't know, 1980, 1985, we sort of flipped from having this lower than average amount of heat content compared to this spot right here to higher. So we know that the heat content of the world's oceans is increasing. No surprise, that means that the temperature um, is increasing. And this graph shows a temperature anomaly of that same top layer of water. An anomaly is a deviation from an average, right? And so our y-axis is this temperature anomaly, how it, it differs, how the, the ocean temperature differs from average. And it, down here is lower temperature, up here is higher temperature. And this is Deviation from average, and this is the same 1971 to 2000, average temperature for the ocean. We have here change over time. This is a longer time series. So look, this starts in 1880, and our previous graph started in 1955. All right, But we see the same general trend, where we have cooler oceans um, than this average, that it stays cooler up until, look, 1980. If we go back to our last graph, we had this flip at around 1980, right? So I don't know, I don't think that's a coincidence. I think that would be an interesting thing to, to study. And we see that in recent years, we have 
warmer than average temperatures in our oceans. All right, so oceans are warming, and we know that this occurs throughout most of the world. Let's take a look at how oceans have warmed across the globe. This is a map of the globe, and this map is showing us change in sea surface temperature in many, many locations around the globe. These data look at changes from 1901 to 2020, so over the course of more than a century, and they tell us where on the globe we have sea surface temperatures that are rising, and those would be the colors that are in red here or even in purple, right? And places where they are cooling. And there's a few places here, for example, right here, where we actually have some cooling water. And keep this in mind, we're going to talk about this later because this is a sort of an interesting place on the earth. And the general trend across the globe in almost every place we look is that sea surface temperature is increasing and you can see from the colors here that it's increasing at least one degree Fahrenheit over that century time period but in a lot of places it's more than that especially if you look you know if we look down here it's more than that one degree if we look in here it's more than that one degree so this is a broad broad trend our oceans are warming and we see extensive data that supports this idea. So what does this mean to the organisms that live in the ocean? In one of our previous lectures, we were talking about marine ecology. We thought about where organisms can live. And we talked about the idea that there were many, many factors that might influence where an organism can live. Things like temperature, things like salinity, things like currents or tide, exposure to things like ice. There are a lot of things that drive where an organism can live. But the most important factor of all of those factors we talked about was temperature. And you can think about this, you know, we don't like to be out when it's too hot. We can get things like heat stroke if our bodies become too hot. We don't like to be out when it's too cold. We can get things like hypothermia when it's too cold. So we are not exempt from this. We are very, very dependent on a temperature range that, that is limited, all right? So it's no surprise that if the temperature of the, of the oceans is changing, then it's going to have some sort of effect on the organisms that live there. Some of the ways that organisms respond to temperature change, um, we see species populations that are moving towards the poles. We see species populations moving to deeper water. We know that some species can't move any further. And when that happens, those populations don't have anywhere to go. Well, what happens to them? And another thing we're going to be talking about is something called coral bleaching. So these are the four examples that we're going to be looking at uh, in terms of how changing temperature affects sea life. The first thing that we're going to talk about is the idea that populations can move when temperature changes. Now this is a map of the northeastern part of the United States. Right? And each one of these different colors represents a different species. So in purple we have the American lobster. Uh, in orange, we have red hake, that's a type of fish. And in this sort of greeny blue, we have black sea bass, and that's another type of fish. And you can see for each one of these, we have data that started in 1973 and ended in 2018. And the dots that are closer to 1973 are lighter in color, and the dots that are closer to 2018 are darker in color. So we can see where these species are over time. Let's look at black sea bass first, and that's these greens here. If you look carefully, these dots down here are lighter than these dots up here. Each one of these dots represents one year, and it represents the average geographic location where that fish was caught by a fishery, where that the population of that fish, of black sea bass, was caught in the fishery, all right? So, so for this year, for example, I don't know what year exactly year that was, it doesn't say, but 
not all of the fish for this year were caught right here. Some of them were caught down here, and some of them were caught up here, and over here, and over here. But on average, this is the average location for that year. And this would have been one of the early years because it's lighter in color. Now you can see these are the later years. And again, this is the average geographic location for these years. They weren't all caught exactly at this dot. Some of them were caught up here or down here or over here or over here. But on average, it's the average location of where black sea bass was caught in the black sea bass fishery. So take a look at the trend here in coloration. Take a look at where the earlier years are compared to the later years. In earlier years, it was more common to catch sea bass, black sea bass, further south. And in later years, it was more common to catch them further north. So we know the population of black sea bass is, in general, moving to the north. All right, And that doesn't mean that an individual fish is moving from here to here. It means that the, the population in general is. And that could be things like recruitment of babies. It could be the movement of, of a school of fish. Um, but there's a lot of factors that go into that.